Hello, and welcome to This Week in Sociological Perspective. I'm your host, Samuel Roundfield Lucas. This week, we discuss an amazing new finding from the study of Mars. But first, I recently spoke with Tyler Brufak, doctoral candidate at Florida State University, about his recent paper titled Social Isolation and Achievement of Students with Learning Disabilities. The paper is to be published in Social Science Research and is co-authored by John R. Reynolds. Mr. Brufak, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here and talk about this. So you have an interesting paper and it focuses uh, just to set the larger uh, sort of background context. It focuses on comparing high school completion rates of students with and without learning disabilities. But before I get started, do students with and without learning disabilities have different high school graduation rates? Well, yes, in fact, they do. So if we look at national estimates, uh, a recent report came out about four years ago in 2018 uh, that shows that students with learning disabilities graduate from high school at about a rate of 65 percent compared to their peers who graduate at a rate of about 84 percent. Uh, so over the years, although they've experienced some improvements in their academic supports and therefore their educational success, we do see some persistent inequalities uh, between students with and without disabilities. Okay, well, so in your analysis, you bring several concepts into the discussion. Um, social capital, social disconnectedness, perceptions of isolation. Could you, uh, what do you signify or mean to signify by these terms? What, what's, what are they reflecting as, you know, real social um, phenomena? Oh, that's, a, that's a good question. So uh, some scholars uh, very astutely point out that the broad term of social isolation can really manifest in, a, in many different ways. Uh, and so that's kind of what we try to do in this paper is that each kind of term we refer to, social capital, social disconnectedness, perceived social isolation, these are three different aspects of social isolation that we're trying to compare uh, in terms of who experiences them and how consequential they are for educational success. Uh, and so social capital is something we are framing uh, as a resource that helps people get ahead in organizations. It's very heavily studied uh, in the social sciences and in, edu in education research as well. Uh, it hasn't really been applied in this way as an aspect of social isolation. Uh, and so we are trying to put a new spin on what social isolation means and a different way that it could be studied. Uh, and our findings do show that it is perhaps an underlooked way in which social isolation affects people. But, and how is that, um, so that's the social capital and, and, and I guess the social disconnectedness is another dimension, uh, is that correct, of, of social isolation and yeah, the yeah, perceptions of... of uh, <laughs> that's absolutely correct. Uh, social disconnectedness, uh, gets at more of the qualitative nature of one's social isolation. Uh, and so in, in our paper, we follow previous work uh, that distinguishes between how people are isolated in terms of uh, if they are lacking connections that they claim to have with others, or if it's people uh, outside uh, of themselves who uh, don't claim them as friends as much of the time, or if it's both. Uh, so there are different ways in which social isolation can really uh, manifest in terms of someone's social network. And then uh, when we get to perceived social isolation, this is also often referred to as loneliness. Uh, we just call it perceived isolation to be a little clearer in the study. Uh, but loneliness is a, a heavily studied topic in the, the social sciences. Uh, and a lot of research does find that the perception of social isolation can be just as consequential as the uh, as the actual isolation itself. Interesting. Um, but, but you're bringing these concepts into a discussion about high school graduation. Theoretically, why might these matter for the likelihood that a student with learning disabilities will complete high school or, and why might it not matter? Uh, I mean, is there a, a expectation that it 
is there a theoretical reason that we would think it would matter? And are there alternative theoretical reasons why we might think it wouldn't matter? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So first, it might matter. Uh, one reason is that these types of connections that students have with their peers, uh, especially in middle and high school, can be really formative experiences and shape uh, their educational pursuits and their plans. Uh, so there's a lot of research that shows uh, the GPAs of one's friends or the courses that they take, uh, it really improves the outcomes of that student themselves in terms of how they perform in high school or middle school, but also whether or not they pursue post-secondary degrees. Uh, so in, in that way, it really helps shape uh, what they perceive to be possible and what they expect from themselves. Uh, now, in terms of the isolation itself, it might also uh, lead students to dislike school or not want to be at school if they feel like they are isolated, if they feel like they're not part of a school, they're not part of that community. Um, and so, you know, there are objective, uh, the objective indicators of social isolation can have material consequences in terms of, you know, how students form their actual expectations, how they feel when they're at school. Um, and it can also shape the resources they have access to in terms of whether they can collaborate with educationally ambitious peers, um, whether they can rely on others to catch up on uh, lost work uh, and people they can generally rely on for help. Well, the, um, your study specifically, this, this is a nationally representative sample. Is it with high school seniors? What's the uh, data that, not, not the name, of, I mean, the name's fine, but the characteristics of the data that we need to know that's a, that's a good question. So uh, these data are from uh, Ad Health. And so students were initially surveyed when they were in middle or high school. Uh, the majority of respondents initially surveyed were in their uh, high school years. So that's between you know, ninth and 12th grade. Uh, but there are also some students who were surveyed at earlier ages. So the sample we used, uh, the respondents were initially between the ages of 13 and 18. Uh, when they were first surveyed. And then they, oh, when you say first surveyed, I guess that means they were surveyed later. Uh, as uh, well. Yes, yes. So uh, the follow-ups that we, um, we follow them in this study up until they were in early adulthood. So that would mean um, on average, they were age 28. And that helped us uh, confirm that they were uh, finished at, uh, pursuing their high school degrees. So, and how did you identify students with learning disabilities? Uh, was it just asking, I mean, did you ask the students, you know, do you have a learning disability? Did you look at some kind of records in the school? What was the means for identifying that? Right, so we used a self-reported measure. And so what that means is that at wave one of the study, the, the initial uh, survey period, parents were asked uh, whether, the student or the respondent had ever been diagnosed with a learning disability. And so uh, what research has found is that generally parents are very accurate in how they assess those kinds of questions. Uh, and it very closely aligns with uh, individualized education plans, which are more of an administrative measure like you were referring to. Yeah, well, when you say self-report, I thought you meant the student, but you actually asked the parents, which is, I guess that's a, that's a, that's not, not a, that's not the organization's report, but the organization's going to probably not differ from the parent on that because the parent has a range. They have to attend the IEP meetings, right? So, right, right. They, the individualized ex education plan meetings. Right, right. They, they do for a time and then uh, towards high school, the, the student can elect to, to have the IED meetings on their own. So... What did you find? Did, were students with uh, learning disabilities having different levels of disconnection or any of these other um, factors that you were looking at? Right, right. So our findings uh, did reflect what previous research had found in that, uh, you know, across the three aspects of social isolation, we ended up having five measures. Uh, and, or we ended up having six measures. Five out of those six measures 
showed that students with learning disabilities experienced more social isolation than their peers. Uh, and so whether it was social capital, whether it was a type of social disconnectedness, or whether it was that students perceived being isolated within their school, students with learning disabilities tended to have worse outcomes in that degree. So this is, they, they, had, they were more, isolated. so that's, so they're differing in their degree of connection with, this, with their peers. But do these differences explain or play a role in their graduation rates? Yeah, and in fact, we did find that. So when we control for things like uh, GPA, uh, respondents sex assigned at birth, their age, uh, their household backgrounds, like parent SES, uh, we did find that still that these types of social disconnection did partly explain the difference in high school level achievement between students with and without learning disabilities. It accounted for nearly a quarter of the remaining difference. So when you say, um, the G so this is looking at two students sort of analytically. I'm trying to make sure I've got understand it. So you had two students analytically with the same race, the same sex assigned at birth, the same parental resources, the same prior achievement, but one has, has been designated um, to have a learning disability and the other hasn't. And simply that difference means there's a difference in their rates of graduation with the student with students with uh, that, that sort of uh, theoretical student with a learning disability having a lower chance of graduating. But part of the gap is closed if they have the same level of connection. Is that a way, the way to think about it? Correct me if, please, say more. <laughs> more or less, I, I don't want to give the impression that we use quasi-experimental methods because we, we did use logistic regression to, to test this hypothesis. Um, what we did is that we, hold, we held all the, those other factors at their means. Um, and so we, we know that factors like race and ethnicity, uh, not the status itself, but the discrimination that comes with it, um, you know, things like gendered processes, age, the resources that families have at their disposal uh, could also inform things like social disconnectedness, social isolation, and high school level achievement. And so we wanted to make sure that uh, we were controlling for those things to really understand if social isolation was indeed connected to both learning disabilities and to high school level achievement. I see. So by saying that the students are, uh, imagine that the students are the same race, and they, uh, given your analysis, you've kind of wiped out that the role of race in, that might be playing a role with social isolation and the role of socioeconomic status that might be playing a role. So now you've got sort of, after those factors, which are very complex and a lot going on, there still seems to be a connection between social isolation and uh, having been designated with learning disability. And that partly accounts for the difference in graduation rates. Right, right. That's what we found. Um, and that really helps uh, attest that this wasn't a spurious relationship, that this is a real association we're observing. Right. So, uh, so I'm glad you corrected my, yeah, I, I understand you're looking in the, at, at one moment in, or, you know, at, at one set of people, they're not randomly allocated to things, but still you can, you can observe the pattern which makes me wonder, well, given these findings, what kinds of things might you say to parents of students with or without learning disabilities and to and or to educators and or to just the wider public interested in assuring opportunity for as many students as, and children as possible? That's a great question. And that really kind of ties it back to uh, the beginning of the paper and kind of the development of this research study was we were interested in understanding what other interventions could improve the outcomes for students with learning disabilities. A lot, a lot of attention has been dedicated to how academic focused interventions can help support students with learning disabilities. And a lot of progress has been made in that regard. 
over the past few decades. But the gap between students with learning disabilities and students with no disabilities has remained very, very similar over that time period as well. And so part of this study was helping to understand how social inequalities are actually helping perpetuate the inequality in high school graduation. Um, and so based on these findings, uh, what we can say is that social interventions might help attenuate this inequality. Um, and so there are some roles that parents, teachers, school administrators, and students themselves can play uh, in helping to bridge the gap. So do you have, uh, uh, that's, that's, well, that's empowering. It's, it's not a, just a given. Um, why, I mean, is the social isolation coming from people, hostility towards students with learning disabilities? Or, I mean, and that would mean if we want to improve their educational outcomes, we need to address that and, you know, do something about that, which, you know, they're all learning. So hopefully in a productive way, not, you know, toward all students, or am I over, overstepping the, the finding? Um, so I don't know how much our research can speak to what interventions would work. We can lean on social intervention research that has examined what programs do and don't work. Uh, and that research tends to find that long-term interventions are the most successful. Uh, and those which uh, bring students with and without learning disabilities together uh, so that they better understand one another. It helps uh, attenuate those discrimination and stigmatization processes that we so commonly talk about uh, related to disability statuses, to race, to gender, to ethnicity, and things like that. So that's, uh, that's really important and helpful information because I can just imagine, you know, it'd be my impulse too that to just rush in with the ones, you know, hey, let's have a, a day on, you know, <laughs> blah, 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 you know, whatever it is. And that's uh, from what you're saying. If we, well, your research has clearly uh, documented that there's some gaps and connected it to this isolation. And then if we're going to engage that, it sounds like we need a longer, a longer term approach. Um, that would be more likely to be successful. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'm not trying to say that any short-term interventions uh, were not genuine in their attempts to help bridge this gap. Uh, it just might be that social challenges often require long-term interventions because uh, you know, social connections develop over long periods of time. And you know, those social connections that currently exist are also the product of you know, people's development over their entire lives. Um, so you know, students who have experienced discrimination and stigmatization for most of their adolescence are probably less likely to you know, want to be vulnerable and uh, maybe risk having relationships with you know, possible uh, oppressors of people who discriminate against them uh, in their past. Well, Mr. Brufek, I want to thank you. This is um, certainly important to anyone who cares about or is concerned about the next generation and the, the future, of, you know, the, the, their success of the, the young ones coming up and their ability to take over the reins of, uh, uh, of uh, society um, and realize their potential. Uh, your paper is uh, very helpful for understanding some of the challenges they face and giving us resources to begin to address it. So, I want to thank you for doing the work and for coming on and sharing it with us today. Oh, well, thank you. It was, it was my pleasure. Happy to do it anytime. Our final segment concerns amazing new findings from study of planet Mars. The April 1 headline on the phys.org website summarizing a nature article sounds like an April Fool's joke. First audio recorded on Mars reveals 
two speeds of sound. But in fact, the headline is an accurate summary of new, to many of us, groundbreaking research. The analysts use data from the sounds of the rover Perseverance, the helicopter Ingenuity, and the Martian wind to calculate the speed of sound. And what they learned is that, owing to the thinness of the atmosphere and other characteristics, high-pitched sounds and low-pitched sounds travel at different speeds. Only 4 one-hundredths of a percent of Earth's atmosphere is carbon dioxide. In contrast, the Martian atmosphere is 95% carbon dioxide. Further, the Martian atmosphere is 1 one-hundredth as thick as the atmosphere on Earth. Thus, on Mars, sound is both about 20 decibels weaker and slower. On Earth, sound travels at 340 meters per second which is about 1,115 feet per second. On Mars, the calculations show that the speed of sound varies between 240 and 250 meters per second, which is approximately 787 to 820 20 feet per second, depending on the pitch of the sound. High-pitch sounds travel faster than low-pitch ones. A quote from the article stands out. The lead author of the research, Sylvester Maurice of the Université de Toulouse, noted, quote, On Earth, the sounds from an orchestra reach you at the same speed, whether they are low or high. But imagine on Mars, if you are a little far from the stage, there will be a big delay, unquote. So, for many concert attendees on Mars, or on a planet similar to Mars, the high notes from the violin will arrive before the low notes of the stand-up bass, even when the strings are struck at the same time. The implications of this physical fact are mind-expanding. The most immediate implication is that, living on planet Earth, few may have realized that actually such a fundamental constant as the speed of sound is not necessarily a constant. We obviously know that the speed of sound can vary because the speed of a sound changes if we put a wall between the source of the sound and our ear. But on Mars, the speed varies even when the medium through which the sound travels is the same. The speed of sound on Mars differs according to the pitch of the sound, not the medium through which the sound passes. It's amazing to find an entire planet whose features are such that the speed of sound varies. Once we realize this fact, many sociological questions about the likelihood and character of sentient life on such a planet arise. By one definition, for a species to be truly social, it must communicate. And if a species is going to communicate, sound provides one way to do so. But how would a species on a planet where the speed of sound varies by pitch communicate? Would their language incorporate pitch as an essential element? For example, might the tense of the grammatical equivalent of verbs be signaled by pitch differences? If so, basically, the species will have embedded the varying arrival times of information deeply into its method of communication. Such deep integration might create challenges for that species to communicate in some other environment, especially one with only one speed of sound or with larger or smaller differences in the speeds of sound. More fundamentally, how might cognitive processes work for a species that communicates through a medium whose character is such that the gap between the sounds the speaker makes and the sounds the listener hears differs? Note that this means that even the order of the sounds might be scrambled between speaker and listener. Might the cognitive apparatus of such a species end up being developed in a way that would make communication between it and an orally monospeed species such as humans impossible? Alternatively, might such a species avoid using sound and instead develop a visual language, much like a sign language, to communicate? Might it enrich its signaling with the equivalent of facial expressions, speed, or bodily posture 
while signaling. White listeners simultaneously, consciously, and systematically respond, making a speaker's expressions a much more clearly collaborative enterprise, a much more deeply social one. Before learning of the varying speed of sound on Mars, I would have simply asserted that the speed of light is a constant. And, truth be told, as far as we know, the speed of light is a constant, and there seems no reason to suggest otherwise. But now I realize I need to recognize that this is an assumption. It's a strongly justifiable assumption with a great deal of empirical evidence behind it, as well as theoretical work, but an assumption nevertheless, at least in the context in which I'm now going to use it. And that context is that assuming the speed of light is a constant, a side language would sidestep the challenges that variable speeds of sound might pose. If so, that is to say, if such a species developed a more, uh, uh, relied more on a sign language rather than a uh, sound language, what humans' experiences devising and using sign language, as well as humans fluent in sign language, be essential for establishing communication if humans were to ever encounter such a species? In that sense, note that the people who are deaf are among the most fluent and adept users and innovators of the various sign languages that exist. Given this fact, might this reveal yet another context where full inclusion of people from diverse backgrounds with different skills and perspectives would prove essential? These are interesting questions, and there are probably dozens more, and they're quite fun to think about. At the same time, they also raise a very serious matter. The universe is an amazingly surprising place. We take a great deal of our universe for granted, because if we did not take it for granted, we would be paralyzed by uncertainty and doubt. Just taking the next breath requires us to make a series of assumptions about the physical world and its stability. Assumptions like assuming that all the oxygen hasn't been siphoned off the planet, no cloud of poisonous fumes has wafted over, our lungs have the capacity and will continue to have the capacity to extract the needed oxygen, and more. We must assume our world is stable and will operate in a similar way from breath to breath. And while this assumption and many others is backed up by human experiences, human experience is less than a blink of an eye in the history of the universe. Still, taking the world for granted is functional for human activity. We need to take some things for granted. Alas, our need to take some things for granted can end up smothering our curiosity as well as our openness to the possibility that there are other ways our cultures, constants, and corner of the universe could be arranged. This analysis of data from our most studied planetary neighbor reveals that seemingly fundamental, defining features of our world need not be common. We have analyzed the sound of only one other planet. Yet this one new source of data reveals that, despite our experience on Earth, half of the planets studied so far have multiple speeds of sound. In that lesson lies an important implication. If we hold on too tightly to what we have learned from living on planet Earth as we journey further, our knowledge may actually end up limiting our understanding rather than providing the point of departure for deepening it. But this sobering implication bears within it inspiration. Activities like space exploration can offer one way to protect ourselves from having too much faith in the assumptions by which we now live. But for that protection to take hold, we have to be open to the possibility that the conditions we find as we explore may not confirm any assumptions we may have of superiority or even competence. Instead, our explanations may actually humble and inspire us, as we might be humbled and hopefully inspired by encountering a species whose evolution on a planet with variable speeds of sound gave them cognitive capacities far different from, and perhaps superior in some ways to, those we 
in our mono aural speeded environment were unable to develop or needed to have. The good news is that we need not wait for space exploration to bring us a chance to marvel at and be inspired by such differences. Opportunities abound for exposure to and learning from and among living beings who hail from different environments right here at the site of our single case study, Planet Earth. That's this week in Sociological Perspective. We'll be back next week with another interview with an author of some important sociological research and more sociological insights on an issue in the news. Till then, take care. <laughs>